completely different because it seems that I have uh, been given the opportunity to end this day of practical oriented presentations with a theoretical presentation. Uh, and oh well, that's the way it goes. Uh, I feel sometimes the need to defend Georgia's education efforts. I think they've gotten a bit of a bad name in recent years. Uh, and there's a sense among my Georgia's colleagues, some of them I think, that um, Georgia's education is all about getting the great unwashed masses and making them sit through progress and poverty. You know, and that's what we do, and gosh, we've tried that and it hasn't really worked that well. Well, you know, I'm willing to teach anyone who will listen, but I think there are, is a bit more that we're up to. And I think that it's pretty important, really, to have a basis of Georgia's understanding and analysis, what I like to call a Georgia's curriculum, that is there for people to use in whatever way they want and can use it. Like I said, I'm willing to teach anybody who will listen, but I'm also very interested in making sure that we understand some of the basic ideas and can be conversant with them. Now, I want to start with a little bit of background on how I started on this topic. Uh, last September, I went to a conference in London with the IU that was at the School of Economic Science. It was very interesting. It had to do with the new urban agenda. And uh, I was delighted to go. And a number of the younger Georgists there were talking about this notion of fictitious commodities. They had been reading the political economist Karl Polanyi. Now, I had heard of Polanyi, but I hadn't read him. I wasn't real familiar with it. But they were saying, that there were these fictitious commodities that couldn't be trusted, the market couldn't be trusted to handle them. I started thinking, oh, what in the world is this idea? Uh, so an article and this presentation came out of that. Georgists are attempting to, have been attempting to diagnose their failure uh, ever since I got started with the Georgist movement. Uh, it seems that nobody's willing to listen to us. It seems that the basic Georgist analysis is passe. And, you know, the land, the revenue thing was fine way back then, but, but the economy has changed. There are lots of other sources of exploitation that must be dealt with nowadays, and that Henry George needs to be modernized. I'm all for, you know, dressing Henry George up in a slightly different style. But I think that the core ideas are still as relevant, in fact, more relevant and valuable than they, they've ever been. And with that in mind, I wanted to talk about fictitious commodities and sacred land. Now, when mainstream economics today talks about the distribution of wealth, they talk about a mixed up muddle of things. It's, uh, you can kind of see some colors in that puddle, but it's hard to say where they came from and how they relate. Describe and predict the distribution of wealth among all of these inputs to production. It's very difficult, it's very advanced, and normally it is interpreted using advanced math. It's very difficult for normal people to fathom. Uh, the classical economists, at least, started out with three clearly distinguishable factors of production. And that helped to simplify the, uh, the analysis of, of political economy a little bit. We could tell the difference between land, labor, and capital. They were functionally different, and you knew which, what goes in which category. The Georgia's remedy makes things even one step more simple by saying we can simplify and rationalize the distribution of wealth by taking the proper component of public revenue, the rent, out of the economy before it gets all mixed up in the pool of distribution. And that's what we try to, um, what we try to, to do. This is, a, this is an image I use in one of my videos for the Henry George School, and I enjoy it. So, Karl Polanyi was a political economist um, he was from Austria, I believe. He wrote in the mid-20th century, and his most famous book was The Great Transformation. And really, The Great Transformation is similar to the theme of progress and poverty. It was the, trans the uh, transformation to industrial society. 
And Polanyi said that in the transformation to the great productive potential of industrial society, uh, society moved away qualitatively from the economic relationships it had had in the past. He felt that uh, pre-industrial economies relied on um, reciprocity and redistribution in various ways to, uh, to civilize and to humanize the demands of exchange. But once we moved into an industrial economy, the market took over and market relationships be became the whole of our economic decision making and Pilate felt that this would lead us to disaster. He wrote, to allow the market mechanism to be the sole dictator of the fate of human beings in the natural environment would result in the demolition of society. And there are a lot of people who feel that way, and it's something that I, could, I find stirring as well, because I can certainly see economic relationships in this day and age leading to the demolition of society. So I can understand why some of these younger colleagues I was meeting in London were persuaded by what Polanyi had to say. He also said, fascism, fascism, like socialism, was rooted in a market society that refused to function. Now, Polanyi was a socialist, but he wasn't a Marxist. He didn't believe in the historical determinism like Marx did, but he, he did believe that society would fail if it allowed just market relationships to hold sway over economic decisions. And in particular, he felt that the economic factors of labor, land, and money were <coughs> fictitious commodities. In other words, these are things that are so important to our social fabric that, that we cannot safely allow the market to determine their value. That their social value is much greater, or at least much different in many cases, than their market value. And therefore, they were, if they were treated as commodities in the market, they, that was a fictitious thing, and that was an unsafe thing that would lead society into disaster. So I got started thinking about this, because I've always sort of thought that the market was a pretty efficient and effective mechanism for making decisions once we removed monopoly out of it. So I, I felt a little bit of cognitive dissonance here. Um, so I started thinking, well, okay, what is a commodity? You look out there and you see various definitions, but in general, I figure we can agree that a commodity is an ec economic good or service. It's fungible. Pretty much one is as good as another. A commodity like a, a pork belly or a, a, a ton of corn or a barrel of oil. And it is exchanged in the market with arm's length transactions. It's something that it has a market value. It's a marketable commodity, okay? I, I guess, does that work as a definition of a commodity? I know it's not really a... Yes. Yeah, I don't know. It's a service commodity. Well, it could be. I'm saying it for, for now, let's, let's assume it could be. Well. Okay, so according to Polanyi, labor, money, and land should not and must not be traded and valued in the market as commodities. So what I'd like to do here is go through each of them and, and examine that, what that means. So if labor, land, and money can't be traded as commodities, what should be traded as commodities? Well, widgets, goods, possibly services, things that are produced, you know, uh, widgets. But it's hard to imagine, I think, a free market in consumer and capital goods that would be rational if these three most important inputs to it are subject to government control. So I don't really understand how we can have any kind of a free market if labor, land, and money are not treated as commodities. So I'm still confused about this program. Let's think about labor first. And the, the first thing that occurred to me when I think about labor in general in the labor market is, of course, that there isn't just one labor market. Labor. Uh, has varying degrees of competition, and there are different labor markets. At the top of the labor market, there is a, a movie star, and there's Jennifer Lawrence, maybe hearing how much money she made last year. Um, it turns out that Jennifer Lawrence made $46 million in 2016. 
Uh, and she basically has a monopoly. Her wages are whatever a movie studio is willing to pay her rather than get some other actress. Interestingly, she was not the most highly paid actor in the U.S. in 2016. Dwayne The Rock Johnson made $64 million. I'm not familiar with his work. Apparently he's a former wrestler and there's some talk of him running for president. I'm not sure, but he makes a lot of money anyway. Um, a bit lower down the competitive scale of labor markets are markets that are not monopolies, but do have some significant barriers to entry, such as professional pro professions like doctors, lawyers, and indeed members of unions. So the competition in such labor markets is limited to some extent, and wages are higher to that for that reason. And at the bottom of the labor market, of course, we have basic labor. Labor just uh, that has no particular skills, education, or bargaining power, just shows up for work, they need work. And uh, it is the, the basic labor, Henry George told, uh, told us, that is the most important part of our economy because it is the wages for basic labor on which all other higher levels of wages are determined. Now, one thing occurred to me about basic labor a few years ago as I was thinking about it, and that is, there is a term that's bandied around in econ textbooks called perfect competition. And this is usually thought of as a theoretical um, absolute that doesn't really happen in, in, um, in the real world. Examples of things that are traded in sort of like perfect competition are commodities like agricultural products and things. But it occurred to me that there is one market where that is perfectly competitive. A, perfect, a perfectly competitive market is where the uh, thing being sold is completely interchangeable and there's a very high supply of it, right? Now, basic workers who have no skills or particular bargaining power are interchangeable. When one dies, you shove another one in there. And the market for basic labor tends to go down to bare subsistence over time. So, in fact, the market for basic labor in the economy satisfies the economist's definition for a perfectly competitive market. Now, this, I think, is kind of where Karl Polanyi was coming from here. My goodness, if the market for basic labor is perfectly competitive, then you can't allow labor to be traded as a commodity because the workers will be exploited and killed, right? Good heavens, you obviously, from that perspective, labor is a fictitious commodity because look what the market will do. Wages will go down to the level of bare subsistence, as various other economists have told us. However, as students of progress and poverty, we realize that the state of perfect competition is not the natural state of the market for basic labor, is it? The reason the basic labor market is perfectly competitive is that resources are held out of use and labor cannot get access to them. Is that not true? And that is what a Georgist would recommend as a remedy to that situation. So the situation in which wages fall to bare subsistence is not the natural state of labor. That's the result of a market failure that holds resources out of use that labor could otherwise use to increase their wages. So it strikes me that it's not the market relationship of labor that is the problem, but rather the market failure that leaves labor with no other alternative. Interesting. Okay. So I'm not sure I'm willing to accept the fictitious commodity status of labor. Not quite yet, anyway. Although, obviously, something needs to be done about the wages of labor, about the situation in which workers find themselves. Now, let's think a little bit about money. This might be more complex and even more controversial. Uh, money is the very essence, of course, of an arm's length transaction. Money has no commodity value. Money is simply a, a medium of exchange. So any, any uh, exchange that involves money is by definition an arm's length transaction. So you would think that commodification wouldn't be a problem with money. However, the complaint that Polanyi and various other critiques of money and banking system, critics of money and banking system have, is that the provision of money and the control over the value and the supply of money gives 
privileged opportunities to certain classes in society, and this creates injustice. One of Karl Polanyi's big, uh, big problems with the monetary system was the gold standard, which he felt uh, advantaged um, creditor countries over debtor countries because if you were forced to agree to the gold standard, you had no option to adjust your currency to, to alleviate the debt burden, among other things. And uh, apparently, the, uh, that international role of the gold standard has been taken over now by inter international currency markets in structural adjustment programs and that sort of thing, and that relationship continues to more or less hold. Uh, so, some sort of, of value-driven control over the money supply and the value of money was needed, Polanyi reasoned, to get rid of the exploitive relationship. Now, nowadays, of course, we don't have a gold standard, we have fiat currency, and as we know, not all of us approve of this, but as we know anyway, most money in the economy at any given point in time is created through, by banks, by the process of loading it out. And many people criticize this as being a source of monopoly income for banks. And I think that is not exactly correct. And I'd like to very briefly explain, I've written about this in the Georgia's Journal many times, and lots of people hasten to ignore me when I say this, but um, <laughs> banks loan money but they get it back when they do it, okay? And banks charge interest when they loan money because it's worth it to borrowers to have the money now rather than later, okay? And banks take the risk. They might not take much of a risk if the deposits are guaranteed by the federal government, but in, in, in theory anyway, banks take the risk when they loan out the money that they might not get paid back. And rates of interest are, go up and down with the perceived risk of loans, et cetera. Uh, in any case, most of the money in the system today is created by banks loaning it out, and at any given time, the rate of inflation basically is the rate of new loans minus the amount of loans that are paid back or, or defaulted. And that's the difference between those two is the rate of inflation, essentially. And the bond. Thank you, that's right. Okay. Now, do banks have a monopoly privilege in this practice? Okay. Is this something, if we believe that, in, if, if we're against monopoly, is this something we, we should be concerned about? Now, I think there are two things to talk about here. One is the cushions from competitions that banks have because of um, banks becoming too big to fail, banks expecting government bailouts when they do fail, federal deposit insurance, cushioning banks against risk, things like that, which are certainly rent-seeking opportunities for banks. I would not, that, not deny that for a second. But if you took away those cushions to banks, would banks be monopolies? Yes. And I think they would not. And I think that you have to agree that banks compete for the business of loaning money. Banks compete. Competition is often restricted, but if the restrictions and the cushions to banking were taken away, banking would be more competitive than it is now, not less. And the service that banks provide is the liquidity at the point at the point when borrowers want it, and borrowers are willing to pay for that for that advantage. So the money supply is really market determined, and I think there are some advantages to this. A lot of people argue, I'm not smart enough to know whether they're right, but a lot of people argue that it isn't possible for a central authority to have sufficient information to efficiently determine the money supply. Because the money supply, in fact, is determined by millions and millions of individual transactions that flow through the system. Uh, now, okay, so what's wrong with money being a commodity then? Well. The banking and money system seems always prone to terrible uh, collapses, to terrible crises of inflation or recession. Okay, so gosh, we can't trust it to take care of things on its own because if we let the market run, it keep, creates crashes. However, a Georgist analysis of this points out the obvious fact that 
the, an underlying problem with our money and banking system is that by far the largest source of collateral for loans in our economy is real estate. And the inherent volatility of the real estate market gives an inherent volatility to the credit market, which leads toward inflation, recession, boom and bust cycles. I think this is well documented, the work of Foldberry and Harrison and others on the 18-year real estate cycle, and this is fairly well documented. I, I tend to agree with the argument that if you removed land value as collateral from the banking system, there would be no inherent instability in the banking system and there wouldn't be any in inevitable tendency toward boom-bust cycles. So, as I said, the perfect competition in the labor market, that's not the natural state of the labor market. That's due to a market failure because labor can't get access to resources. The tendency of money and banking to lead toward crises is not the natural state of money and banking. It's due to the underlying instability that banks, that's caused by banks using land bank as collateral and this creating a pressure on the banking system that's ultimately unsupportable. So I'm not, I'm not really that down with refusing to see money as a commodity either because I think the market provision of money could work if we didn't have the monkey wrench of land grant making the system inherently unstable. That's the way it looks to me. Now let's look at land. Land is the gift of the creator, okay? Um, and I mentioned, now land of course is very much traded on markets. The market for land is something that is studied in great detail. And you can get all kinds of reports and analyses of it every, every day. So the land market is an ongoing concern. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to argue that it's a good thing. But I was talking about sacred land. And that's something that we think about sometimes. The uh, protesters at the um, Keystone and uh, Dakota Access Pipelines, one of the things that, that they were saying was that the pipelines were going through sacred sites. And this is one of the things that brought a lot of support to their, to their cause at the time. Now, personally, I believe that there is such a thing, there are such things as sites that have particular spiritual power. I believe that, that that exists. But that's not the normal thing, that's sort of a special thing. But what about sacred land? What are we talking about there? Well, I always go back to Chief Seattle. And for those of you who don't know this, I've told many of you this before, but the speech that was attributed to Chief Seattle of the, of the Sukamish was the tribe, I think, the West Coast, that was this environmentalist manifesto that was reprinted in a children's book and was rather famous, was not the true speech that Seattle gave. The true speech that Seattle gave was nowhere near as willing to let the white man off the hook. And this is the remark that Seattle made that has always stuck with me. Because President Franklin Pierce had made the request to buy their tribal lands, and Seattle made a speech in response to this. And he said, we will consider your offer. When we have decided, we will let you know. Should we accept, I here and now make this condition. We will never be denied to visit at any time the graves of our fathers and our friends. Now, it was very clear from the context, and it was very clear from any rudimentary understanding of Native American understanding of such matters, that what Seattle was talking about was the entire North American continent, because that's where his relatives and friends were buried. It wasn't just a little cemetery in Washington State. What he was saying was, we do not recognize the justice of selling land to you. You're going to force us to sell it because you have all the power, but we do not recognize the moral validity of this transaction. That's really what he was saying there, because if he is allowed to, in perpetuity to visit the graves of his ancestors, then nobody else has secure tenure to land. They can tramp all over it any time they want, right? So that, I believe, is what Seattle was saying. And so he was not recognizing 
the moral validity of this land transaction, and by implication, he was saying that sacred land isn't just special places, but all of the land. And I think that's something for us to consider, perhaps in a hard-nosed economic way. Of course, in political economy, we define land as the entire material universe, except for human beings and their products. We're all familiar with that definition. Now, when we came here from the airport, we went through an amazing example of urban sprawl. One of the most picturesque and sort of appalling examples of sprawl I've seen, although they're all over the place, um, the hollowed out cities of St. Louis and East, East St. Louis, surrounded by spread out strip malls and suburban developments, a remarkably inefficient use of territory and use of infrastructure and resources, major sprawl. Well, the entire American economy is characterized by this inefficiency and this major sprawl. Uh, I'm not going to read it now because uh, I don't have the book in front of me, but. Um, Mason Gaffney, in one of his essays, made the point. He talked about a, a rather older, a rather established suburb in, in um, Wisconsin with tree-lined streets and, you know, a good established suburban community where people have yards and nice homes. And the population density of this community was something I believe was like 10,000 per square mile. I'm not sure I had that right. But in, in any case, Gaffney did the math and he found out that at this density, the density of this nice suburban community, which is less dense, by the way, than that thing is, the entire population of the United States could be housed in a circle with a radius of 100 miles, which is an area approximately the size of South Carolina. So there is, if you look at an efficient way of housing people in a community, and the way we actually house people and use land in the United States, you see that mind-boggling waste <laughs> of natural resources and infrastructure that characterizes our sprawled economy. And this is bad for the economy, it's bad for the environment, it's bad for the quality of life, and I would say if land is sacred, then this is blasphemous. <laughs> I would go that far. But it's not just housing sprawl that we contend with in the economy, we also contend with transportation sprawl with many airports, using a much more land and more fuel than necessary, with agricultural sprawl, with capital intensive huge industrial farms, creating way more corn than we need to create, for example. I'm sure you must be aware that depending on the year, between 32 and 38 percent of the United States corn crop is turned into ethanol and burned in cars. The United States burns more corn in our cars than Mexico grows. So capital intensive farming is not the only way to provide people with food. It's an, it's a, an example of what I would call blasphemous, unproductive sprawl. Um, and, we hit, and the sprawl leads us to uh, infrastructure, sprawl, a power grid that's larger and less efficient than it needs to be, and all manner of problems that lead to problems with both efficiency and justice in the economy. Okay, now, I'll get back to that one. Uh, is this the natural state of the land market? What do you think? No! Hell no, right? It isn't, because we have a tax system and an economy that rewards underuse of land and creates all of these problems. So Carl Polanyi would say, oh my gosh, look at what trading land as a commodity in the market does. It's unsustainable and horrible and blasphemous. We can't allow land to be traded in the commodity as a market. But the Georgia's response to that would be, okay, look, we need the land market. The land market is very useful to us. Because the land market tells us what the level of rent is, right? The land market tells us how much is the right amount to collect for public revenue. So the market is our friend. It's the land monopoly that is our enemy. And I think that's a very, very important distinction to make. So I 
the thought about the fictitious commodities argument of labor, money, and land, and I found it wanting in all, in all three cases, and I found it wanting in all three cases for the same reason, because we make the tremendous error of making the natural opportunities private property, and this messes up all three of those supremely important markets that we have. And I want to get this message out to some of my younger colleagues who are persuaded by the, you know, the emotional appeal of these arguments. Because I think it's important that we understand how the market works and we, have, we understand what the potential of a market economy really is when we remove these elements of monopoly that should have been removed all along. Uh, and of course, another aspect, and that's why I put in, you know, the boundary here, another aspect of the sacred land is the fact that there are such things as global resources. And in the issue of climate change, uh, the atmospheric commons is becoming more and more important all the time. And I don't, and in, by the same token, the um, balance, the ecological balance of the oceans is being shown lately in research to have a much more important effect on climate change than was previously understood. So the acidification and warming of the oceans and the biological ramifications of this in the ocean also has a large effect on climate change, it turns out. These are resources that are not administered by any one national entity. They're global resources. But we need to come up with a market understanding of their values so that we can deal with policies so that we begin in something akin to the, the uh, methodology, I think, that Nick Tiedemann was outlining of, of um, resource proportionality. We need to think in terms of the market value of these ecosystem services so that we can start to charge the true value of them to people who are degrading them. And I don't believe we can get there without the market. I think the market is absolutely vital. So it made me a little nervous when I saw some of these colleagues being so suspicious of the market and talking in terms of fictitious commodities and land labor and money because I thought that was leading us toward a, down a very distracting path and, and I'd like to try to avoid that. So, so that's why I wanted to share this. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I get the feeling we have some time left. How are we doing? Yes, we've an hour later. We actually have 25 minutes for questions. Awesome. Okay. I'd like to talk. Is this on? Yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit about monopoly. From its Greek roots, monopoly means single cell. But its meaning has expanded. And when my father used to tell my sister to me, don't monopolize the bathroom, he wasn't <laughs> saying, don't be, try to become a single seller of bathroom services. He was saying, don't take more than your share. And I think that we need to recognize that when we use the phrase land monopoly with respect to land, we don't mean that single seller. There's not a single seller of land. We mean don't take more than your share. So I think it's important in a presentation like yours to distinguish between the way you use land, monop land monopoly and we can talk about monopoly with respect to banks. Well, don't, you, don't mean that it's a single seller or any particularly unique parcel. No, I, that, no. Parcels are interchangeable. There's a single uh, seller of any single pen. That doesn't mean there's a monopoly in pens. No, the, the phrase land monopoly refers to the fact that people are taking more than their share and not leaving enough for others. I think that's the only reasonable way to understand land monopoly. But with respect to banks, you were using the other definition of monopoly, the, the single seller, and you were right. There is not a single seller of bank services. Uh, there is a problem with banks, but that's not the problem. Uh, but there is also a sense in which getting to pure competition in banking isn't the solution either. Because if we have a perfectly competitive banking system, what will happen is that the potential value of the banking system will be dissipated and banks offering all sorts of extra services to their customers. We need to have a different kind of banking system where there isn't any possibility, even if there were a monopolist, for the, uh, the, well, the people who are offering banking opportunities to uh, make a special uh, profit from the fact that 
they're allowed to create money by lending it out. So again, yeah, that leads me to a commodity-based banking system? No, that leads me to a banking system in which we don't create money by lending, but rather, not by lending by banks, but rather by having a central bank lend money to all of us interest-free. Oh, yeah. Um, I'd like to I did that. Yeah. Hmm. I'd like to agree with that. Um, if you had a, a free market in a competitive market in banking, most of the, the rent would be distributed to uh, the bank depositors or the other people that uh, basically to, uh, and, but the other thing is that some of the largest depositors in banks are other banks. So they are really getting um, a, lot of, a lot of revenue, a lot of rent. And one way to really see how large that, that rent is in the banking system is imagine that you had 100% uh, reserve requirement for banks. If you implemented that, the supply of money in the United States economy would drop to zero. And what would happen in that case is that the Treasury would need to issue new money to prevent the, uh, the supply of money from dropping to zero. And that would result immediately in trillions of dollars of new revenue for Treasury without a drop of inflation. So if you see, if you imagine that scenario, you can see that there are trillions of dollars of, of rent uh, in the banking system up for grabs. So. Um, I'm not, uh, I, that may well be true, and I'd like to acknowledge that the money part was probably the weakest part of my presentation here today, and that there are many debatable points to be made about it. I'm not, I, I'd like to talk with you about that more as we go. I'm not sure I completely agree with that to the level that I understand it, but that Dan's going to set us straight out. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to say that I disagree with you about money. I do, but I don't want to say that. <laughs> what I want to say is that Henry George disagrees with you about money, and it's very explicitly and clearly. And, but what I want to quote from George is the underlying principle of all of his positions, which is when somebody gets wealth without producing it, they necessarily get it from those who did produce it. So when a bank creates credit and, and monetizes that credit, the bank has a value that it, that it gets money for, and it will get additional money for that it did not create. The value of that money is created by the entire society of producers. That's why inflation is too much, they say inflation is too much money uh, chasing too few goods. And so it's the people who produce the goods that produce the value of money. And the irony is that we tax the people who are producing the goods instead of taxing the land, but also instead of taxing the people who are creating out money out of nothing. But the or banks just, don't get the value of money. The banks get the interest. The, ba the banks get the interest, but they're getting interest on something they didn't create. They're not, all they did was they created credit. They do not take a risk because the credit is collateralized. The farmer who borrows money to buy a new tractor is taking the risk because if there's a failure, it's his farm that is lost, and it's lost to the bank. That's true. And once again, I mean, I think there are debatable points here. I think you're making a good point. We could argue about it more at dinner or something. You know, but I'd like to not spend this whole question on this whole session on the money question because there are so many questions. I mean, I take I take your point. Um, but I, I do think that we agree, in any case, that in some way, the supply of money should be market term. Would you agree with that? Uh, no. Well, it should be market. <laughs> it, it should be market determined, but it should, that that determination should be assessed by the by the central bank or the treasury. The same way land value is determined by the market, but in, but for land value tax purposes. It is assessed by the government. Okay, I can accept that. For uh, time being. We have people getting in line, and we also have people raising their hands. So after these two people who are in line, don't, don't get in line, just raise your hand. Okay, Mr. Um, I'm wondering about this because um, as the Institute teaches and our George's. As George himself wrote, um, land is not wealth, and labor is not wealth, and money is not wealth. When 
Polanyi enthusiast, also very much interested in Henry George. I was trying to put them both together for his books and writing, but anyhow, maybe sometime we'll connect you with him. You mentioned transboundary resources and pricing of them, yes, I believe. And have you had a consideration of the law of the seas, which is the UN and its international law, a problem not being well enforced, if at all. And that was to charge 50% to the corporations who mine these mineral nodules from the ocean floor. It was just uh, some corporations that had the technology where they could mine the, mineral, the ocean floor for the minerals, but the international law was to charge not set a set amount, but a percentage, 50%. And that was by who? Charged by a UN body. Okay. Okay? So this has to be agreed by the treaty. This law is already agreed by the treaty. Okay? It's international law, but the UN has no mechanism for enforcement. That right. doesn't fall down. Oh, but are you asking what I think about that? I'm, I'm asking you first what you think of simply not having to think through how much it's worth, but simply that the market tells you and then the body collects a percentage, in this case, law of the sea of 50%. Yeah. No, that's a good question. I may not be as well read on it as I could be, but I think the market gives you some information, and you should get all that information. But the, the jurisdictional question affects the market value, the ability of people to actually enforce these agreements, I think, is part of the whole question, right? Well, um, and then part of the kind of set of coming from that, then contribute to enforcement, also to ecological cleanup and restoration and that kind of thing. Yeah. One other point that, that I think might deserve making is that I think there is a useful distinction that you can draw between resources, there, there are transboundary resources such as rivers that affect different countries, um, which is not a global resource, but it's a transboundary resource. There are also resources such as deep sea minerals and things that are perfectly locatable. They're not necessarily a global resource. That's what I'm talking about. Now,
Absolutely. Yeah, I thought that's what I was trying to say. I hope I made that clear. And furthermore, you know, as our friend, um, the, the late um, um, Israel Pensack, what dis, uh, famously said, rent is not a problem. Rent is a good thing. We want more rent. We don't want rent to go into private hands, but we want more rent, right? And by the same token, we want the market to tell us how much rent there is because the market is good at doing things like that. Thanks, everybody.